Oh. Okay. I haven't yet, but it's sitting right here so that I don't forget. Um, yes, there we go. 422, I hope, I hope you know this song. It makes it a lot easier if you do. <clears throat> Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, spirit of the living God, all fresh on me. We have just offered up a personal and collective prayer before the throne of God. It's, a, it's an important thing. We didn't just sing a song. This was a prayer. And every person who sang this song just prayed that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the living God would fall on them. The question is, do we really believe that the Holy Spirit is going to fall fresh on us, that the Spirit is going to melt us and mold us and fill us and use us? And if he does, what does that look like? What's he going to do? Will I feel it? How will I know if or when my prayer is being answered? We all know that we're supposed to be led by the Spirit because the Bible says so. Romans 8, verse 14, every person who is led by the Spirit of God is a child of God. But I wonder if we've ever given thought to the fact that being led by the Spirit is essential to salvation. It's like baptism or faith or grace. It's not optional. Because it's essential to being a child of God. No, listen to what it says. Every person who is led by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God is a child of God. So if you're a child of God, you are led by the Spirit. You don't have a choice. The problem we have with things like this is it's mystical, and we don't deal well with mystical stuff. We kind of like rules because we can check those off. And this whole idea of receiving the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit, uh, Paul says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in you. So what does he do? It's an important concept. I have somewhere between 350 and 400 sermons that I have developed on my computer 
over 70 years of preaching. 25 of them are pretty good. When I decided to use this, this lesson, as a main thing topic, I really wondered how people would receive it. Because, you know, and I'm not trying to be critical, we don't, we don't do a lot with the Holy Spirit. It's not an integral part of our theology. And I thought, you know, some of these folks won't be accustomed to hearing a sermon on being led by the Holy Spirit. So I prayed before I began this 10-day odyssey that I've been on the road, which just lets you know that I'm not as bright as I would like to think that I am that God would lead me to select a lesson that would be challenging and inspirational to you. And I was hoping it would be one of the 25. So this is what I came up with. So if you don't like the sermon, blame it on God. Mm -hmm. This whole lesson is basically a story. And the beauty of this story is its simplicity and its ordinariness. There is nothing unusual about this story. This is the kind of thing that happens to people like you and I every day, except that we don't see it. Every aspect of this story was orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. I didn't see that at the time because my daily life, like yours, is controlled moment by moment by materialistic necessities. When I look back, over the 74 years since I first obeyed the gospel and received the gift of the indwelling Holy Spirit, I realized that hundreds of events that I attributed to luck or coincidence or things that are just life were actually orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. But I didn't see it at the time. I'm so caught up in eating and working and getting everything done that I don't see what's really going on in my life. Over the years of my life, I have flown at least 400 times. When I was young, I used to think that flying was exciting. So I used to look forward to it. But after 9-11 and after COVID and after getting old, I now dread it. It's interesting looking back. I, I just wonder if you, how many times have you flown? And how many times was there something memorable about that particular flight? Over those 400 flights, I can only remember eight. I mean, distinctly, because something memorable happened. Maybe I should say something memorable happened that I saw. Something memorable may have happened on many more, but I just didn't see it. This is one of the eight. And one more interesting thing is that nearly every time I flew, I hope you listen to this, nearly every single time that of those 400, my wife drove me to the airport 
And before I got out of the car, we prayed. 400 every time. We never failed. That God would use me to touch somebody's life or bless somebody's life. Every time. Yes, we'd sit in the car, hold hands, and pray. Use my words to inspire or bring peace or conviction to someone. But I don't remember ever actually looking for that to happen. I don't remember the ever actually looking for that to happen. Because you, you, know, you pray things and you just pray of them over and over and over again. And somehow they don't, they don't stand out. We just get used to it. You know, like guide, guard, and direct us. I don't know if you grew up with that or not, but every prayer that was uttered when I was a kid had a guide, guard, and direct us in it. Well, it just blew over my head. I didn't know what they were talking about. So, although I prayed that, I had no idea how God would do it. I mean, how is he going to do that? And I'm sure that he did, but at the time, I never saw any connection between the things that happened and our prayer because I wasn't looking at them from a spiritual perspective. Early in my flying experience, I developed the habit of making my reservations far ahead because it was important to me to have a window seat as close to the front as possible, okay? Because I didn't want to have to wait for other people to get off of the plane. This is all important. I mean, it wasn't important at the time. But if I hadn't developed that habit, this whole story would never have happened. On this particular flight, which was San Diego to Phoenix, Phoenix to Dallas, and Dallas to Lubbock. My time between flights in Phoenix just happened to be so tight that I decided, actually, I see now, I was led by the Spirit to decide that I had better sit on the aisle. Okay? And never sit on the aisle. I decided to sit on the aisle. And I'm, I'm going over these details because they're important. But the only aisle seat available was in row nine. Not as close to the front as I wanted, but I took it. And that seemingly insignificant, thoughtless, led decision but I think Holy Spirit inspired is the reason why out of 400 flights, this is one of the eight that I remember because that's why I happened to be sitting on the aisle in row nine when she showed up. She was really young. I mean, really young. 15, 16, maybe 17. And she was really tiny, no more than five feet, and much, much too thin, not over 100 pounds. She had thin, blonde hair, and she was not pretty. She was wearing an old sweatshirt three times too big for her. She had a backpack. She was dragging a huge duffel bag, and she had a baby in one arm a very tiny, fussy baby. He was nervous, fragile, and exhausted. And that is what I saw. And that is all I saw. Listen, please. I did not see her as a potential answer to my wife and my prayer. You hear me? 
I did not see her as an opportunity, as a potential answer. I saw her as a potential worst case scenario. She might sit in my row. If you ask me today why I did what I did, I would have to tell you that the, the decision had to be from the Holy Spirit because it simply could not have been mine. And the reason is really embarrassing, but I got to tell you, or you won't understand the story. One of my, this is embarrassing, one of my worst character faults is that I am extremely uncomfortable with small children. It's the truth. The smaller they are, the more uncomfortable I am. I was uncomfortable with my own children until they got old enough to take directions. Now, in order for you to understand the rest of the story, I have to explain what I mean by the word baby. This baby wasn't a newborn, and I'm really not good at this, not at all. Any woman here could take one look at that baby and tell you within three days how old it was. My best guess is somewhere between nine months and three years. Now, if you use your imagination, she comes down the aisle slowly, tentatively, looking around anxiously. Obviously, she's never flown before. She stops right beside me. I'm in the aisle seat of row nine. And she says so quietly, I could hardly hear her. Sir, could you tell me how to find the road numbers, the row numbers? I said, yes, they're posted right up there. She looked up and then down at the crumpled boarding pass that she was holding in the hand with the baby in the arm. And she said, well, then this is row nine, isn't it? Oh, dear God, please forgive me for all of the un-Jesus-like thoughts that galloped through my mind before I said, yes, it is. He said, which seat is 9A? I said, it's that one, the window seat. The truth can really be embarrassing and painful. My first totally self-centered thought was 220 seats on a regional jet, and she sits in my row. Why me? Why me? She said, where do I put this? She pointed to the duffel bag that looked like it held all of her earthly possessions. I said, it goes in that cabinet right up there. She looked up at the compartment and she looked down at the, and she looked at me. I said, here, here, let me help you. She said, thank you. She's on the verge of tears. Thank you so much, she said. And she wasn't just being polite. It was the sincere gratitude of a person who's totally helpless and has become, please listen to this, accustomed to being ignored by people who look like me. Because when people who look like me see people who look like her, we get very uncomfortable because her life is obviously a mess. And people who look like me, don't want to get involved in the lives of people who look like her. I said, I'm happy to help. And it was the truth. Because my discipleship, my desire 
to be like Jesus was finally starting to show up. While I wrestled and shoved the duffel bag into the compartment, she put the backpack on the middle seat, sat in the window seat, shoved the backpack under the seat in front of her, and began trying to comfort the baby, who was now crying loudly. This was not good at all. And in spite of my desire to be like Jesus, no, no, I know the truth is the truth. I actually thought about asking the stewardess for a seat change. I'm pleased to tell you that my desire to be like Jesus trumped that thought and wouldn't allow me to embarrass her in front of all those people. The baby continued to cry. At first, it was just a tired, petulant, generally unhappy with life kind of cry. She tried plastic toys and a bottle of juice. Both ended up on the floor. She tried talking and pointing out the window. Nothing worked. The cry became a full-blown, screaming, piercing howl of anger. When the engines roared to life, the baby jumped and screamed increasingly. The desperate mother clasped her hand over the baby's mouth, held it as long as possible, but every time she relented, that hysterical, blood-curdling, high-pitched torrent came hurtling out. It didn't seem possible that something that small could generate that much noise. I glanced over at the mother and saw her way too thin body wrapped and convulsing with sobs. Huge tears are streaming down her cheeks as she tried desperately to comfort the baby by bouncing it up and down, except she wasn't bouncing it. She was jerking it up and down like if you mix a can of paint. And I interrupt the story to call your attention to something important. Nobody on that plane knew me. No, this is important. Nobody on that plane knew me, and I would never see any of those people ever again. So I could do absolutely nothing, and nobody would blame me or think less of me. And I could still think of myself as a Christian, but I could never again think of myself as a disciple of Jesus Christ. I said something important to you, because it's the truth. That thought caused me to decide that I ought to do something. And I knew, no, I knew that if Jesus was here, he would do something. He'd do something, but what would he do? And you know what? I knew what he would do. I knew. I knew, I knew in my head. I knew exactly what he would do. But the thought of actually doing it, I'm trying to tell you a real story about a real person who really wants to be like Jesus, and he's in a situation that he hasn't bargained for. And I don't have 20 minutes to figure out what I should do. But the thought of actually doing it immobilized me. And then my body turned. I leaned across the empty seat. And I heard this mysterious voice say, Ma'am, would you like for me to hold your baby? I knew it wasn't my voice, and I started looking around to see who said that. But in my heart, I knew it was me. And I hoped she'd say, oh, no, I'll be fine. Thanks for offering. But, and if she did, my desire to be like Jesus would be satisfied, and I could feel good about myself and not have to suffer through the ordeal of actually holding that baby. But she didn't say, I'll be fine. She looked at me like I was an angel from God. And through sobs of desperation, she said, are you sure you wouldn't mind? 
I just don't know what to do. And it began to dawn on me that I was actually going to have to do it, which terrified me. But again, I heard that mysterious voice thoughtfully and kindly say, Ma'am, I'm sure I can't do any more than you have, but I could give you some relief. When she handed the baby to me, the movement of the exchange, accompanied by a new face, quieted it for just a moment. And then the screaming started again and got worse. And although it wasn't natural for me to do what I did, this didn't, this wasn't natural. But I did what I had seen my wife do 5,000 times. I placed it over my shoulder. I began a slow, rhythmic, rocking motion. And then I did something that was natural for me. I began to hum Rock of Ages. The mother said, I know that song. Would you sing the words? She slid into the middle seat and listened, even hummed and sang a few words. And it didn't happen suddenly. It's never that simple. It happened slowly, almost imperceptibly. I finished Rock of Ages. I started Old Rugged Cross. And then it was, I need thee every hour before the baby's crying began to lose steam. And she said, I don't know that one, she said, but it's real pretty. I said, it's called, I need thee every hour. And right then, it was appropriate. She said, would you please sing the words? I sang all four verses. By the time I finished, the baby had stopped crying. She said, it's a miracle. I think he's asleep. And of course, it was a miracle, but not as she meant it. She said, would you mind if I rested my eyes for a few minutes? I don't think I can stay awake any longer. I said, no. No, I don't mind at all, and I didn't. He said, please keep singing. It's very soothing, and I did. One by one, I sang those priceless, precious old hymns I learned as a child. What a friend we have in Jesus, and precious memories. And while I was singing safe in the arms of Jesus, I became aware that the little girl's head was on my shoulder and she was fast asleep. It wasn't until the wheels struck the landing strip in Dallas that she shook herself awake. Where are we? She said. I said, we're in Dallas. Oh, my goodness, she said. I must have slept for hours. I said, yes, you did, and I'm sure you needed it. How's the baby? I said, he's still asleep. She said, oh dear, your arm must be broken from holding him. I said, no, actually it went to sleep about an hour ago. I can't feel it anymore. Here, she said, let me take him. I said, why don't you wait till we're at the gate? Then you can hold the baby and I'll get your bag. At the gate, I handed her the still sleeping baby, wrestled the duffel bag out of the overhead compartment, and as we were deplaning, I got a little separated from her, and a man, who apparently had been sitting somewhere behind us, touched me on the shoulder. I turned around, and he said, Thank you for what you did for that little girl. I don't think I could have done that. I said, You know, sir, I didn't think I could do that either. And I wouldn't have if it hadn't been for Jesus. It's Jesus who makes me do things like that. He said, I'm sure that's true. When I caught up to her, she said, I'll take the duffel bag now. You need to hurry to catch your flight. I said, actually, I'm going to go to baggage claim with you. 
There's no way you can carry the baby, your backpack, and this duffel bag and get your suitcase. Will anyone be meeting you? She said, no. My parents both work, and they told me to take a bus. I said, they told you to take a bus? She said, yes. I said, honey, there are no buses at DFW. She said, what am I going to do? I said, well, let's get your suitcase. I'll figure out something. We retrieved the suitcase. I said, listen, you're going to have to take a taxi. She said, I don't have any money for a taxi. How will I get one? I said, well, come with me. I'll take care of that. At the taxi stand, I said, do you have your parents' address? She said, it's in my backpack. I held the baby. She found the address. I took it to the taxi driver. He said it would cost between $50 and $60. I took five 20s out of my wallet, gave the driver three of them, opened her tiny little hand, put the other two in it, and said, I paid your fare. This will allow you to get something to eat. Is there anything else I can do for you? Anything at all? She said, no, but thank you for being so kind. I don't even know your name, she said, but there's something about you. I, I wish I could talk to you sometime. I gave her my card and said, all my contact information is on this card. I'd love for you to call and talk to me. And if you ever need anything, anything at all, please call me. I want you to know that I care about you. But you need to know that Jesus cares more than I do. And I pray that you will find Jesus and Jesus will bless your life. I was already settled in my seat on my next flight when it dawned on me that I didn't even know her name. I'm sorry to say I never heard from her. We may not be able to heal people like Jesus did, but we can pray for them and we can be kind and we can show them that we care. We can bind up wounds. We can tell them about Jesus. We can encourage them. Or we can hold someone's baby. And that's what it means to be led by the Spirit. Simple story. Everyday kind of story. Nothing unusual about it at all. Every one of you runs into these kinds of situations. Sometimes, like me, you, you don't see them. They're easy to pass up because, see, she's right. People who look like me are uncomfortable with people who look like her because her life is a mess. And she doesn't know and never will know that mine's a mess too. I'm just able to cover it up with clothes and cars and houses. I cover up my messed up life. But she's too poor to be able to do that. We have to go into the world believing something. I'm almost done. You and I have to go into the world out there believing something about why things happen. We have to believe something. And we either believe that everything's an accident or coincidence or just life, or we have to believe that God really is involved in this world and in your life. It's a choice. We can't go around with a half pagan, half disciple of Jesus explanation like, well, sometimes it's luck and sometimes it's coincidence and sometimes it's 
a God thing. Maybe the Holy Spirit. But we can't have it both ways. You can't have God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit either in control of everything or they're in control of nothing. I'm saying something important to you. They're either in control of everything or they're in control of nothing. And you can't have God in control of the good things, but not in control of the bad things either. Well, that's the lesson. Got a couple of minutes. Let's sing a verse of Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy river side which flowed be of sin the double cure save from wrath and make me pure i need thee every hour most great no tell voice like mine can peace afford sing it I need oh I need thee Free hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. God bless you. Thank you for being here.